So I'm just going to jump right in and talk about one of the projects that we actually just got funded for. And actually there are two ALS projects that I don't know that you know about. <laughs> so which one? I wasn't even sure which one you were. Are we talking about the reception <laughs> one? Okay, so I'll mention the other one too at, at, at the end. Um, so uh, this is uh, this is one of the really active projects that we're working on now. Um, and it, it originally was Dr. Encho Wang's idea. Uh, idea. She's sitting right here. And um, she actually one day ran up to me five or six years ago and said she just read this article from Pebble Labs um, about resagiline and the use in ALS mice. And um, resagiline is a drug for Parkinson's. And it was just being developed for Parkinson's then, wasn't it? And so now it's sort of a standard treatment for Parkinson's. But, uh, and it was making the mice live a lot longer. Um, so, uh, so she said we need to study this in ALS. And at first I sure right, you know, we were busy and I just sort of ignored it. But then we, she stuck with it and she ended up getting a grant from Teva um, to study this in a small number of patients. Uh, and then it was supposed to be 30, it would be 36 ALS patients. And then we, that was pilot data. And so that data we used to get a larger federal grant from the FDA Open Products Division, which is like 1.6 million, but we, even, even 1.6 million wasn't enough. We needed more money to do the biomarkers, which I'm gonna tell you about. So we went to ALSA for the biomarker part of the, uh, of the next study and ALSA funded us just recently. So we're just getting started on the second part. So it's really a two-part story. And so why resagiline? So resagiline, was originally developed for Parkinson's disease, but there had been a lot of work on it uh, in the in basic science labs indicating that it probably worked at a mitochondrial level. There is some evidence that th there is mitochondrial dysfunction in ALS. It's unclear if it's the chicken or the egg. Dr. Swordlow here at KU had been working on mitochondrial dysfunction in Alzheimer's and ALS, um, so that fit well with uh, what we were, uh, uh, what some of our scientists were looking at. So, and then at the same time, there was a large study going on that was started by a drug company called Knopf that then Biogen took it over with the other Parkinson's drug called Arsamopaxone. And everyone thought that study was going to be positive. Um, and we were involved in it. We were site. We enrolled a bunch of patients in, in, in that study. And, um, and so we were working on the resagiline thing. And because the pilot data from the Paxil study was very positive. So we thought, boy, we were really onto something with resagiline. They're very similar mechanisms of action, but it's a drug that's out there on the market now, and if Primopaxol works, then we bet resagiline's gonna work. But the problem is, Primopaxol, after the big phase three, big pharma study, results were announced last December, it didn't work, at least in that, in that study. There are still some subsets of, that, of the cut patients that were in that study that the drug company thinks may have been responding to the drug, but overall, in aggregate, the five or 600 ALS patients around the world that were in the Biogen study didn't seem to do better on Primopaxel. That's taken a slight bit of wind out of our sails, but we're still pursuing this line um, to see if resagiline may have an effect on ALS patients. So as I mentioned, it worked in SOD mice. One of the uh, ALS doctors in Israel had used it uh, in, a, in, a, in her ALS clinic population, and she thought it was working, and then I didn't know it until late last year, but it turns out we were not the only people thinking about resagiline. Uh, the ALS doctors in Germany also uh, had been uh, thinking about it, and they were they are just now starting a resagiline study in Europe, uh, Dr. Ludolf. So uh, we're we're both working on this. So we did the Dr. Wang's Teva initiated grant. Um, uh, uh, that, that she was funded through, through Teva uh, had uh, this, these sites. And so you cannot do ALS studies at one site. It's impossible. Even though we see a lot of ALS patients, Dr. McVeigh and I and uh, Dr. Wang see three or four new ALS patients sometimes a week. Uh, on max it's four, sometimes it's one or two, but every week there's at least one or two ALS. So you think that what you should be able to do is study at one site. You, you can't. Um, and for a lot of reasons, some people are too advanced and 
won't meet study criteria, um, and you need at a minimum five or six sites to do, this was even a 36 patient study. Um, and so we use sites in the Western ALS study group, the WALL study group, which is led by Bob Miller, and I'm one of the other leaders in that. And so we pick sites, uh, some who have been very experienced doing ALS trials, and some were really just starting out, like University of Nebraska, who we've become big partners with, and is part of the ALSA uh, network here, we keep working the foundation. And so these were the uh, sites that were involved. They all ended up enrolling patients in the study. And as our primary measure to see if the drug is working, for the last 20 years now, we use this ALS functional rating scale. And it's a pretty simple measurement of the function of an ALS patient. Uh, and and uh, Murray uh, Walsh, our head coordinator on the ALS studies, or Laura, will actually get this information. It's usually not uh, the physicians, it's usually the research coordinators. And they, with the patient, they, uh, they grade them. So we only put the grading for the first two because the others didn't fit on the slide. But you can see each one of these has a, has a four-point system. And, um, and, at the, uh, and, and at the end of the day, you get a score. Normal would be 48. The lower the ALS FRS, the worse your ALS is. And so over the last 20 years, we've used this tool a lot. And we actually can predict pretty well that it drops about one, roughly one point per month in our ALS patients. And so we um, uh, put patients with resagiline, uh, put our ALS patients that met criteria at these uh, eight or so sites on resagiline at a higher dose than is used in Parkinson's. Instead of one milligram a day, which is the Parkinson's dose, we use two milligram. And we, uh, followed their ALS FRS. So this was the first six months um, when they were on resagiline, and we thought we were seeing something. So the ALS FRS declined by about 0.96 per month, and, and the uh, other patients who had been in studies before, not on resagiline, um, declined by about one per month. So we actually thought we were onto something at six months, and we were pretty excited, but then we finally, all the patients finally finished and we had the data in May, and in May it turned out that of these, no one was on a placebo, everyone was on resagiline. On average, the patients declined by about 1.1 ALS FRS units per month. So we didn't hit a home run with resagiline. Um, and this is actually comparing it to some of the other studies of the ALS FRS and some of the other studies that we've been involved in. Um, so again, we had 36 patients in the study, uh, 18 males, 18 females, the mean age was 60, um, the mean ALS FRS at the beginning was 38. Um, they, all the patients that entered did pretty good breathing, um, and so, uh, so that's the ALS FRS slow. But at the same time, uh, uh, our, Dr. Wang and I were thinking, well, how else can we look to see if resagiline may be having an effect in the patients other than the ALS FRS, because we're just looking at 36 patients, we may miss an effect. You usually need four or 500 patients to see an effect of a drug. Um, uh, and so, uh, so we asked Dr. Swerdlow, who runs the Alzheimer's Center here, could he think of any mitochondrial biomarkers that we could measure in patients that are getting the resagiline? And so he actually, uh, in his laboratory, uh, came up with some assays uh, to look at one, two, three, four, five different blood biomarkers of the effect of, uh, to, to see if recession was having an effect in these patients. Uh, and so that, these are the ones that we did. They were all blood samples that were taken at the beginning uh, and at the end of the 12-month study that the patient were taking the drug. And uh, they were really interesting in this. They, they were really interesting. So. Um, there were two markers uh, using two different uh, techniques that measured the mitochondrial uh, membrane uh, uh, polarization. And in, uh, what, what we were able to show in the patient, and all, the, all the blood samples were shipped in from the 10 sites from around the country, um, and what we were able to show in the patients that their uh, mitochondrial uh, became hyperpolarized in the blood, the mitochondria in the blood cells, when they were on resagiline. 
Now, it's not nervous system cells, but it's blood cells. You can't biopsy nervous system cells very easily. So it's a, it's a surrogate marker. So that was exciting. Um, we also, uh, Dr. Schwartzla also measured this uh, measurement of lymphocyte indexin level, which is a, uh, a measure of cell death. And, he, and we were able to show that uh, th this declined, or there was less cell death in these blood cells after a year of treatment. And then the last uh, measurement is this BCLX VATS ratio, which is used in cancer uh, as a biomarker, where you want where you want to see the inverse ratio. And cancers cells are growing, that's bad, and ALS cells are dying, and that's bad. So you want to see the um, uh, uh, you, you want to see this ratio actually uh, increase over time, and if you want to stop cell death, and it actually did. Uh, in, in, the, uh, in the blood cells. So that was actually very encouraging. Um, there was actually, oh, this is the last essay, there was an oxidative capacity measure, which also seemed to go up over time in the blood cells. So there has really been a search in the ALS community to try to find biomarkers that we could follow in patients when we're first doing pilot studies to see if maybe we're, uh, the, the drugs uh, may be having an effect in patients, and we think that we may be onto something here. We're not sure um, uh, in looking at these sort of blood biomarkers. So we think that based on the uh, pilot data that there is some scientific rationale to further study resagiline. We may be seeing an effect, and so we're going to publish this data now. We actually had a med student here from KU who was on this project. Um, Zach Mackey, is he here? Is he could come. And he actually took a major role, uh, we got him involved in a summer research project a year ago, and he's still involved. He's been presenting this data at ALS meetings for the last year with us, and uh, he's helping us get this paper together. And so that rolled into the next study. So while we were doing this open label study uh, funded by uh, Teva, we put in a, a grant to a federal agency. The FDA has a regulatory arm, which is huge. It also funds rare disease research that most people aren't aware of that. And so uh, we were ultimately successful in getting this grant from, um, from the FDA. Uh, and uh, it, the, the funding started about a year ago. And so for the last year, we have actually been working on, on, on uh, uh, getting uh, all the study forms ready, getting all the sites activated, getting the drug, again, generously donated by Teva, um, sent to a research pharmacy in Iowa that then, just, then gets sent out to all the other sites. And this is actually a placebo-controlled study. So it's going to be 80 patients instead of 36. 60 are going to get resagiline and 20 are going to get placebo. Um, and we're going to do the same Swerdlo biomarkers, but we're also adding uh, three other biomarkers uh, as well uh, in this study. So uh, one of our colleagues in Columbia has been measuring in the urine um, two levels that uh, we think may be a, a, a biomarker for oxidative stress in the body. Um, and so we're going to be sending urine to this lab in Columbia. Um, there is a, we're going to do, be, do, we're going to be doing some uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy at Hopeland Brain Imaging Center, which Dr. Smith already mentioned, which is just uh, next door. That's only going to be done on the KU patients. Uh, and, uh, and, then, and the Columbia patients, two sites. Um, and then we recently uh, got to meet a, an investigator at KCUMB in town, uh, the, one of the other medical schools, who can measure this protein in platelets, TDP43, and there is some evidence in the ALS literature and also in Alzheimer's literature that TDP43 may uh, collect over time in the nervous system. And he's actually got this assay where he's been measuring it in platelets and Dr. Burns and Swordlow's Alzheimer's patients. And so we're going to be measuring it in our ALS patients too. So the, actually the ALS um, grant funding is really going to pay for, uh, or help us pay for all of this stuff here. Um, uh, the, the actual uh, patients getting the drug, paying for the coordinators uh, at, at, to see the patients, paying for the statisticians and the uh, data management, that's going to be the FDA grant but the uh, also grant's going to fund the biomarkers. So I think that's actually a really good example of how a federal agency and a nonprofit granting agency can work together, plus industry, because in, uh, Teva is still supplying 
the drug and placebo at no cost to us. Um, so we sort of had to put all these things together to make this grant work. Um, the, um, the, the study is, uh, again, going to be sites in the Western ALS study group. We're using a group called the Muscle Study Group, which I'm also involved in as our data management and uh, randomization center. Um, these are the sites that are, uh, that are in the, uh, the new Resagium 80 study. Um, uh, Nebraska's in again. Uh, we, we weren't sure, for, but we were able to get them in. Uh, and so that's, that's very nice. Uh, and uh, the goals are what, what I've been reviewing to see if two milligrams a day of Resagium can slow the rate of ALS um, using the ALS FRS, and then see if the biomarkers uh, can, uh, can, can be used to, as a measure of mitochondrial function. And now we'll have a placebo group. Uh, to, so we can really see if that, if that data from the pilot study is holding up. And then get some additional safety data. I'm, I'm, I think I'll talk about placebo in just a minute. I've already mentioned the biomarkers that we're using. Uh, and we have, we have done some scans on ALS patients here at Hopeland using magnetic fragment spectroscopy and, using it and looking at glutathione levels. We've only done a, uh, a handful of these. How many? About five or six or seven? Four. Um, in, in the ALS uh, patients, um, just, uh, so they can look at this glutathione, which is another measure of oxidative stress. And so uh, our uh, folks at Hoagland, Dr. Choi, has actually been doing this already in the MS population. And they published this data now, uh, Dr. Choi and Dr. Lynch, our MS expert. And uh, they were able to show that uh, the glutathione levels in the MS patients were at baseline, this is not treated MS patients, were actually lower than controls. And we're actually just going to see uh, in our patients uh, at baseline here in Kansas and in Columbia, what the glutathione levels are, and does it change with resagiline or not? It can this be used as another biomarker? Um, so uh, that is actually where we're at with the resagiline study. Um, I think, did we just get the drug? Uh, or it should be coming. In the next day or two? Um, uh, from Teva to the University of Iowa Research Pharmacy and then to the sites. So we're, we have a list of patients who, uh, who said they want to be in the study and we're going to bring them in and uh, start randomizing them here in Kansas first and then the other sites uh, in the next few months. We want to get all 80 patients in the study in the next uh, six months or so. Uh, and then we can follow them for a year. So that's just sort of one window of what we're doing with one drug in ALS. But obviously, as you know, we wouldn't be here if we had the answer for ALS yet. And so the this is a list uh, that we put together that talks about uh, uh, how busy we've been here in Kansas uh, trying to do ALS research for the last 13 years, Dr. McVeigh and I and our team. And uh, we have been in a lot of negative drug studies. And they're all listed here. So every one of those, uh, you know, when you say no benefit, and they are negative studies, but some of them were very small studies, and um, a decision was made uh, after studying 30 patients, 60 patients, that there just wasn't enough signal there to go on to a big three or 400 or 500 patient study. Um, the, um, uh, the, the one at the bottom uh, that some of you may know about, the Neralta study, which is an infusion that sort of destroyed uh, bad macrophages uh, in, in ALS. Um, that was, we were one of uh, just a handful of sites in the United States doing that study. And the results are actually unclear. It looks like there may be an effect of the drug. Maybe. It's unclear. It wasn't a flat out negative study. But it was a very small biotech company. And uh, we, we had like 10 patients in the study here, something like that. And there were about 50 or 60 patients nationwide. And, um, and then, they were done with the study, the, the data has been presented at meetings, and they have not been able to get, uh, the, the company was too small to financially fund the next level of the study. So they've been actually out now trying to find investors and another large drug company 
that will take them up to do the next study, which is what happened in the Arthur and Paxil study. It was a small biotech company called Knopp, and it looked like there was positive data from their early study, and then they got Biogen, a huge big pharma study that does MS drugs, and they, took, they were able to financially fund the next level of the research. So, um, so that study, the Neuralsa study, is sort of stalled at that level. And that's clearly a frustrating barrier in, in, uh, in research and rare diseases. Um, there, we have been involved in two positive studies here, but, uh, and we're, we're happy about that, but they're studies, they're drugs which actually don't alter the eventual course of ALS, they're symptomatic therapy. So we were a site in Malbloc study, which is botulinum toxin, where we injected it in salivary glands here and in five or six other sites, and it actually helped ALS patients which were struggling with too much saliva production, one that oral, when other medicine wasn't working. And then the new DEXTA study, which is a drug that can uh, benefit ALS patients who are laughing and crying too easy, um, which is a problem some ALS patients have. And Dr. McVeigh was the principal investigator here on that study. And that, that was a positive study. And that drug, based on that study, was marketed um, for this indication. Um, but they're still, you know, small little baby steps. So, um, that, so that's sort of where we've been. These are the uh, studies which are now <coughs> active at KU. Most are drug or device studies. There's a couple uh, uh, non-intervention studies. So we've already talked about the resagiline. Um, Cytokinetics is a drug that uh, the small biotech company um, thinks they have this compound that can make muscles contract stronger and, and, and improve weakness and it's being used in ALS and in other diseases and more site than that. Um, diaphragm pacing, uh, so one of our surgeon colleagues in Cleveland invented this uh, stimulator that can stimulate the diaphragm to contract, um, so it may help ALS patients breathe easier, and we are uh, putting patients in, in that study. Um, there's an old cardiac drug, Maxillotine, um, which has been around forever, and we've used it in muscular dystrophy, but Dr. Brown at, uh, in Boston and the Niels group thinks it actually may help ALS, and so we are just beginning to enroll patients in that study. Um, the other drug study is Actar, which is an injectable, very high-dose potent steroid drug uh, by, by a company called Questor, uh, and Dr. McVeigh is the PI on that one. Uh, and then the others, the ALSTP is sending blood to Dr. Agbus outside the resagin study. We're going to look at the levels in our patients. Um, we're sending blood and urine samples to Dr. Mitsumoto at Columbia, New York for his oxidative stress study. And then we're going to start sending some genetic uh, uh, material to um, the group at Wash U who have asked us to contribute uh, to that study. So um, there are some things um, in the future some of these are definitely going to happen, and some are still uh, grant submitted that we don't know if they're going to get funded yet. So uh, this, I don't know if you know about this, but this Tepuzumab study is pretty darn exciting. So uh, Dr. Ladha is a young ALS uh, clinician scientist uh, in Arizona, and he, there's this drug, Tepuzumab, which uh, inhibits the immune system. There's a, a, thing, a, 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 a chemical in the immune system called interleukin-6, and it knocks down interleukin-6, and there's some preclinical data in the basic science labs that might help ALS, and so he developed this protocol to study it in uh, 50 or 60 patients, and also just funded it, and it was announced at the, um, at the uh, Niels meeting. You were there, and I'm, and so I've been helping. I've been helping Dr. Lata on that. So I'm listed as the co-PI on it. So it's uh, it's me and Lata are going to lead that study, and that will start in the next year, and we'll be one of the sites here at KU. So that's pretty exciting. Um, he has money from Meals, from Alsa, and he still needs more money. And actually, it's it's it has to do all the biomarkers he wants to do. So we're actually going to MDA, and MDA and ALSA have been working better on this now, on some of these joint arrangements. MDA already knows ALSA has funded it, and they seem very open to giving him the extra few hundred thousand that he needs 
to, to do the rest of the biomarker. So that's actually pretty exciting. That's why I have a question mark there. Um, my good buddy uh, Todd Levine, also in Phoenix, uh, but at a different institution, he just got another FDA grant similar to ours, but to study the Alzheimer's drug Namenda um, in ALS. And there's some reason to think that maybe Namenda might work in ALS. And so that just got funded, and um, we're helping Todd with that. We're actually going to do all the data management here in Kansas for that. Dr. Wakeman's going to do it. And so that will be starting this year as well. Um, as Sally Dwyer knows about this PCORI initiative that we're doing. PCORI is uh, the new research arm for, it stands for Patient Centers for Outcome Research Institute. It's actually an agency that, and it's a non-federal agency uh, that, that's co-funded by drug companies, insurance companies, and I don't know who else. Maybe, probably your tax money. <laughs> um, and it's going to be uh, where doctors and, and healthcare scientists can go to get funded to do outcomes research. And so this is the hot new thing. As NIH funding is going down, the Cori funding is going up. And so our uh, computer scientist here, Dr. Wakeman, is the lead. He's put together a team of informatics experts uh, connecting uh, from Minnesota, Milwaukee, Kansas, obviously down to Texas, um, to, to uh, get all of our electronic medical records to talk to one another. Uh, it's an informatics project. And we had to pick one rare disease as a demonstration project um, to show how we can connect the electronic medical record data in a rare disease population. And since um, Dr. Wade and I are friends, I said, well, why not ALS? So ALS is the demonstration project. So we'll know in a couple months if this gets funded, if it does, it's going to change the way we do research in the United States for everything. But ALS will be on the front line of that. And so our idea is, if this gets funded, we will, all the ALS patients seen at all of our clinics, will be entering ALS FRS into our EPIC EMR. We'll be able to see all that data in real time. We'll be able to put patients on different drugs under a protocol um, and follow their ALS FRS in the clinic. It's actually going to put Marina out of a job. Which I know you want. You know, uh, because it will actually uh, eliminate that whole um, level of research coordinators where you have separate study farms and separate study visits. It's actually done in real time in the clinic. Now, it's not going to, I was sort of being facetious, we're still going to have to do the traditional research studies for brand new investigational drugs. Um, but for drugs that are out there on the market, like Namenda, like Rosatulin. We can just do these in real time in the clinic. And so I was just emailing Todd Levine yesterday and saying what we want to, what I want to do is once we get this going, I want to do a cocktail study where we put ALS patients who, who meet criteria, let's put them on Rosatulin, Namenda, and Rolutec all at the same time. And let's see what happens to the ALS FRS over six months or 12 months. And I think that's going to give us answers quicker than sort of the way I sort of explained in the Resagiline story, which is the only way we really can move forward right now. So I think that's really going to change things. Um, one of our audiology PhDs, Jeff Searle, has a, uh, wants to do a study looking at lip and tongue strength in our ALS patients. Uh, he, uh, he and Lindsay, uh, uh, what's Lindsay's last name? Hendrick. Hendrick. It's hard to say Hendrick. I get it confused. Lindsay Hydrick, who comes to our ALS clinic and sees our patients with swelling problems, they're going to work on this and look at some new uh, uh, measurement uh, systems to measure tongue and, and lift strength in our ALS patients. So, I think that's it. Oh, it's not it. So, this is the team. So, um, it's not the whole team, but it's a big part of the team. And um, so, you cannot do this sort of work without. Uh, a huge team effort. This is just the Kansas City part. Um, when we do these ALS studies that I've already alluded to, it's really a national effort um, to get everyone involved. Um, and then on the ALS clinic, I just put the ALS function clinic, there's a whole team of 20 healthcare professionals there as well that are involved um, with, all of our, with all of our work. So I think that's it. So I hope that gives you a little bit of flavor of what, it's, uh, what we're doing here. We've been very busy for the last 13 years doing ALS research at KU. We don't have the magic answer yet, but um, I, you know, I think with all of the 
activity that we have, all the energy that's going into thinking about this, input from patients, um, input from our nonprofit organizations, uh, especially also, and um, the sort of the team that we built nationally across the country. Um, I, I'm convinced we're making some progress, uh, and if there is a drug out there that's going to help slow this down, I think we have the infrastructure in place now where we can, uh, uh, where we can find it. I'll stop there. Thanks.